set. All right, podcast listeners, your host, Tim Berthold here. Today on the show, I'm lucky to have Dr. Oscar Chavez. Dr. Chavez is a veterinarian and also chief medical officer at Just Food for Dogs. That's justfoodfordogs.com. Dr. Chavez started his career at Banfield, where he became chief of staff and was then the director of the Animal Health Science Veterinary Technician Program at California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, uh, where he has remained to this day an adjunct faculty, researcher, and professor of veterinary clinical nutrition. At Just Food for Dogs, the company creates fresh food for pets in open to the public kitchens. They launched the fresh whole food movement for pets back when they opened their first kitchen in 2010. And a team of in-house veterinarians formulate each meal using only fresh whole food human grade ingredients. They also offer do-it-yourself kits for pet parents interested in cooking daily recipes at home. They have kitchens in California, Washington, and New York. But if you find yourself in any of those other 47 states, you can also order meals at justfoodfordogs.com. So be sure to follow them on Instagram. They post lots of tips, updates, and other cool, exciting info on on healthy dog topics at Just Food for Dogs. So Dr. Chavez, thanks so much for being here and welcome. Hi, Tim. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about nutrition. It's my passion and my focus and uh, very excited to be on the show. Excellent. So why don't you take a second to fill in anything I may have missed there and we'll get right into things. No, you pretty much got it all. Um, uh, you know, I, I think um, we're going to talk about how I ended up at Just Food for Dogs. But yeah, it's uh, my previous job. Um, I used to teach at Cal Poly Pomona University. And um, the way I ended up uh, getting involved in one way or another with uh, nutrition is that uh, Sean Buckley, the founder of Just Food for Dogs, um, he wanted to run what we call feeding trials, which is a form of research that's done on pet food and, and vets look for that in the veterinary brain. And we'll talk about that as well. But uh, long story short, he was looking for a way to do it uh, that didn't include the traditional way, which was to use USDA uh, laboratories that house uh, laboratory dogs, which are usually beagles. And you've probably seen the the videos of the beagles being retired from this lab life and they touch grass for the first time and <laughs> it starts off as a sad video and then they're all playing in the grass uh, later so um so that's sort of uh why i got in first connected with the company uh as a faculty member at cal poly Pono university i was teaching veterinary nutrition and we uh helped uh just food for dogs run the feeding trials okay Great. Well, super excited to get in all things dog nutrition here. I mean, we, we, we've touched on it multiple points in various episodes with different vets, you know, with, with raw fooders, talking about kibble, home cooked, et cetera, all kinds of uh, things. You know, nutrition is like politics and religion in, in some sense. You got to be, you know, people are very opinionated about it and lots of different perspectives. So excited to get, uh, you know, a different one here. Um, and, and Dr. Travers, why don't you take us back to the the moment when you first decided to become a veterinarian how did that how did you go down that path yeah great question uh so most of my veterinary career choices or shifts have centered around a dog which is uh which is uh great for me because it, it's an easy story to tell so in the first Part. So I actually uh, grew up in Southern California. I got into undergrad at UC Berkeley. I actually showed up at UC Berkeley not knowing what I wanted to do. Always had a passion for animals, but if I'm totally honest, the study and the schooling kind of scared me with the level of the classes for uh, pre-med or pre-vet. And so I kind of wandered for about a semester and a half uh, trying to figure out what, what was right for me. And then in my second semester, I got a puppy. Her name was Shadow. And uh, I was, I, it, it sounds kind of silly to admit at this stage, right? But I was a naive student, didn't, a naive pet parent, never had a, a pet, didn't know uh, that you need to get vaccines and what those vaccines were. And obviously I was looking into all that, but uh, long story short, within the few days that I had her before being able to make my first appointment to get the vaccine series started, um, she started having vomiting and diarrhea in the middle of the night, and uh, I took her to the emergency room. Um, and sure enough, uh, she came down with the deadly virus called Parvo. And uh, this mm -hmm. is known as the puppy killer, right? Because unvaccinated puppies mm -hmm. 
will die 50% of the time if they come down with parvo. And I'm getting a crash course in all this as a freshman in, in college. And quite frankly, I didn't have the money to uh, treat the, the, the parvo virus properly, which would entail five to seven days hospitalization, intensive care, and I kept getting uh, you know, quotes for upward of $2,000. And, and now in being a vet, knowing what it entails, it, it makes sense. But at the time, I was just like, what am I gonna do? So I ended, up, uh, the, I ended up taking her home from the ER. They put fluid under her skin. And the next morning, all I could do is just call vet hospital after vet hospital in my area until I uh, finally found a vet. I kept explaining my situation. Finally found a vet, her name was Beth Phillipson, I'll never forget, and she uh, said, look, I, this is not the best treatment, and you're, quite frankly, your pet might not survive, but it's better than doing nothing, so let me do this. Come on in, I will teach you how to give uh, subcutaneous fluids, fluids under the skin, I will teach you how to give antibiotic injections, because she couldn't hold anything down, so we had to somehow nourish her during that time, um, it's not the same as IV fluids and it's not the same as being hospitalized and, and but hey, it's better than nothing. Uh, it's going to cost a fraction of it because you're just going to pay for the supplies and it, with a little luck, you might end up, you know, being able to treat her. And mm -hmm. so um, long story short, after kind of recruiting some, I, I was in a frat at the time, so in, uh, recruiting some frat brothers and, and sticking to the program and three or four days later, she was holding food down. Um, then we can go to oral antibiotics and uh, within a week I was changing or declaring my major because I was undeclared into pre pre vets and uh, kind of that that part is is history there then later what would happen um, is that uh, so then I, I ended up going to vet school in, in the UK um, I also got another dog uh, his name is Ray and uh, he's a golden retriever. And later what would happen is the way that he performed on the food, once I finally got him on, this is just food for dogs. We had already done the feeding trials and I was getting more familiar and comfortable with this way of feeding and, and these formulas. And he had kidney disease. And so I put him on the food later in his life. He was about 14 or 15. And he ended up living to be about 17, uh, wow. to be 17 actually. And so I, uh, that, that sort of made me realize that this food uh, is, there's something to nutrition and that the food uh, does uh, play a role and um, essentially eventually made me uh, leave Cal Poly Pomona University, which was a tenure track faculty position. I was one year away from tenure and people thought I was crazy, including my own mother, um, and uh, join what essentially was at that time an early startup. We only had one location in Orange County hmm. um, because I truly believed that my impact would be greater uh, at, you know, if, if we can get this uh, in the hands of more veterinarians. And so um, it was a gamble that would pay off later because uh, we've, we've been successful at doing that. Um, but really it's been the impact of my pets and their influence on me uh, during my, my life uh, that have shaped my career. Um, now I have a golden retriever. His name is Bruce. He's two and a half years old. He's an English cream golden. And he hasn't told me what to do next yet. So I'm still waiting for him to, to tell me, like, what, what, what am I supposed to do next? He's just enjoying his puppyhood and having a great life. So um, we'll see where he takes me. Nice. Wow. Well, very, very cool stories. I think that's one of the more um, interesting ones I've heard about someone's path to veterinary medicine. Usually you hear, you know, someone from the age of 10 or 11, they're like, I want to be a veterinarian. And that's their yeah. entire focus. Um, but you had a kind of a, a pretty um, significant life event that uh you know drew your interest to it so very cool story um i guess you know there's so many places we could start with all this so why don't we just start with you know someone who you know has a new puppy a new dog and they're totally overwhelmed about how they can feed their feed their dog you know they're they grew up with a dog let's say like i grew up with sunny golden retriever and you know sunny's diet was pretty simple we had the purina dog chow kibble 40 pound bag we'd pick up every few weeks and sometimes i'd warm that up with some water but that was basically what sunny ate and now there's so many other options out there you know there's um you know the home, home cooked prepared um that you can you know order online um you know like what what you guys do or or, or pick up fresh 
Um, there are supposedly better versions of kibble. There's the, of course, the raw food movement um, right. and lots of little pockets within all of that. Um, so what would you say to someone who probably just says to you, hey, Dr. Chavez, I got a new puppy. How should I feed her? Yeah, great question. And really the best way to answer that question is really to kind of tackle a little bit of what you had said in, in, a very, uh, in a very eloquent way, which is a lot of people are looking at nutrition and the topic, especially with pets, like it were religion, right? And so it's almost like, what do you believe? Are you, do you believe raw? Okay, then this is what you have to do. Do you believe uh, in kibble? Well, then this is what you have to do. Do you believe grain-free? Well, then there's this section over here. Oh, you believe freeze-dried? Okay. And so it becomes a little bit difficult to decipher through the facts when there are lots of beliefs. And really, you have to start asking yourself, well, where do those beliefs come from? And in my opinion, in many cases, the beliefs come from effective marketing. Um, and so what I say is, what are you basing your decisions on? Are you basing your decisions on really good marketing, a really good concept? Um, or are you basing your decision on evidence? And as a veterinarian, we uh, always embrace and promote the idea of basing all the decisions we make on scientific evidence. We, we call that being evidence-based and we deem the proper uh, level of evidence as uh, peer-reviewed, published research in a reputable journal. And so when you start looking at that and from the lens of what does the science say, uh, then I could start answering your question backed by, I hope, science, right? And, you know, and, I, and I hope a little bit more than just, oh, this is what I believe. Um, and so in that context, what I would recommend based on everything that we have encountered and seen, and it's quite frankly, the reason we do the things the way we do at Just Weeds Your Dogs, is the emerging evolution of food for pets. So we've always had dog food, but now what's emerging is you have food for dogs, you know, and uh, yeah, we started it, we were the first, um, but now it's, it's the next sort of innovation or evolution in, in pet nutrition. And I can say that quite frankly, because we're not the only ones doing it. If I were to try to say this five years ago, it would have been too early. People would have looked at me and said, ah, yeah, you're saying that because you're involved in it. Um, but now I can say it uh, in full transparency because we're not the only ones. There's a handful of solid competitors that exist out there that do a version of what we do. Most of them are online based. Um, and subscription models. So kind of like Blue Apron or Home Chef, right? You subscribe on their website and you get on a recurring order and it shows up at your door for a week or two weeks. Um, and, and that uh, is, is similar to what we do, except that we also have that available, but we also have retail actual locations and kitchens that you can visit uh, and see the food being made. So so we started with the brick and mortar and, and have sustained that, that um, business plan. We also have partnered with veterinarians. And so we have retail locations which in the lo within the lobby of veterinarians where you can get the food. But the idea is all the same, which is fresh whole foods made with real ingredients. And the science is already backing up that decision to feed real food. But then we are also, uh, there are uh, work being done now that just keeps doubling down on that. And not just in their nutrition, not just in our pet's nutrition, but uh, the same parallel is occurring a little bit ahead of us in human nutrition as well. Mm -hmm. So that would be my answer. My answer would be the best possible nutrition you could feed is what the science tells us. And in both in human and in pets, the science is telling us that a well-balanced, whole food diet, what I mean by whole food is actual food items. So uh, things that have been grown or farmed um, and, uh, and no, nothing processed or, or as little process as you can include. So we don't have any processed uh, ingredients of food in our food. Um, and so that's, that's really why is because we believe that's the healthiest. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and where does, so just food, food for dogs, there are no raw, there's no raw feeding. This is all we're talking cooked yeah. meals, right? 
Yep. Yeah. And so I think the, the question you're asking is a good one, which is, well, how does raw fit into that? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we have nothing against raw in the sense that it is in our opinion, whole food. So raw uh, is the ingredients in their wholesome self, right? As minimally processed as you can imagine, because they're not even cooked. And by cooked, I mean cooked in, in temperatures that you and I use in our own kitchen, not, mm -hmm. not in a factory or, right? So, the, but, but they're still raw. The only, the, the downside to raw really comes down to the uh, substantiation and the marketing claim behind them. And, and in many cases, the formulations. So a lot of the raw folks and the folks that um, feed raw, uh, I agree, are, are likely feeding a better diet than a processed kibble. And that probably leads on the short term to the transformational outcomes they observe. They tell their friends, their friends feed raw. And then what happens is you start getting mm -hmm. um, you know, um, some validation there. So I, I believe in that raw movement. But the problem is that what has emerged alongside with the raw food has been um, the, the substantiation of this idea that your dog is a wolf um, and that you have to feed them like a wolf um, and that they have a nutrition that is more uh, carnivorous uh, than, uh, than, than they actually do. And that uh, they're genetically not, you know, one of the things I hear consistently is dogs are 99.9% .9 genetically identical to wolves. Therefore we should feed them like wolves, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you and I are 99.9% .9 identical to chimpanzees and we cherish that 0.1% because it makes us human. Likewise, there is research to suggest um, out of the journal nature in 2014 that dogs share more similarities in their genetic makeup with respect to digesting food to us, particularly in their ability to digest carbohydrates, than they do with uh, wolves. And wolves even have some uh, coding in their uh, genome for digesting carbohydrates. Dogs just happen to have more, and then humans have even the most. So, so it's just not scientifically, again, that evidence-based mm -hmm. standard, it's not scientifically backed that we should be feeding uh, dogs uh, high protein, low carb diets. And unfortunately, what a lot of pet parents don't understand or, or don't realize is that you can meet a dog's protein nutritional needs pretty easily. You don't actually need all that much meat in order to do so. Um, and then after that, it's all excess protein and the body has to deal with the excess protein. And there's only two ways it can do so. It can either store it as fat or it can eliminate it in the urine. And unfortunately, the process of taking protein and getting rid of it in the urine is a biologically expensive process. It taxes the liver, it taxes mm -hmm. the kidney. And the concern over long periods of time is whether you are putting unnecessary burden on those vital organs. And so it's no surprise that then when a dog ends up getting liver or kidney disease, they will go on a low protein or controlled protein diet to give those organs a rest. Well, our position is why not feed them a balanced diet to begin with, mm -hmm. balanced with healthy carbohydrates, healthy vegetables, healthy fats, so that you're not relying on all your calories coming from protein. And if you have a better balanced diet, um, then you can spare potentially additional work and vital organs that you really don't, I mean, you really don't need that, that to be happening. So that's sort of our reason for going with a uh, balanced diet. And a lot of the raw diets are high protein and in our, in our opinion, not properly rounded, not properly balanced. Mm -hmm. But then the other side of it is we cook all of our food to the same temperatures you cook in your kitchens. And that's deliberate as well. The reason being behind that is because vegetables, when cooked, actually start breaking down that plant wall. Um, and the cooking process allows the dog to digest the vegetables better. And uh, you, know, you and I, we can eat a raw carrot, no problem. Why? Because we'll sit there and we'll chew the carrot. Well, you give your dog a, a little baby carrot as a snack and they'll love it, but they'll probably like chomp on it once and swallow it real quick, right? And so it's not gonna digest as well as if it were boiled or, or, or uh, cooked in some way. Mm -hmm. And so we cook our food to maximize the nutrition out of it, especially 
with respect to vegetables. You know, what's, what's interesting, and one of the things that, because um, a lot of what I do is teach as well about students, and one of the exercises that we go through um, is, is we kind of tackle another misconception, which is that raw food is inherently more nutritious than cooked food. Or, or conversely, sometimes it's put, the cooking process will get rid of important nutrients. And so you can go on uh, the USDA database and look up the nutrition of any food item. And so what I'll do is I'll put a, a six ounce uh, chicken breast, for example, raw, and six ounces of the chicken breast uh, cooked. And then we'll look at the um, data and see how much calcium is in each and how much uh, you know, uh, selenium and, and, and iron and manganese and basically go through all the essential nutrients. And what you almost always find in every case, literally of the 40 or so essential nutrients, is that you have a higher concentration of those nutrients in the cooked food. And the reason for that is it's a, it's a myth that cooking the food destroys nutrition. It just doesn't. But also when you cook, you sort of um, you lose a little bit of water weight, and so you concentrate the volume a bit. And so weight by weight, you're going to get a concentration of nutrition uh, when you cook the food. So it's just not true mm -hmm. that you cook the nutrition away. I, I think what those folks that, that um, uh, because there's always some truth behind, uh, behind a myth, right? I think what those folks are referring to is that there is the potential of stripping away nutrition when you overly process it mm -hmm. or ultra process it like can be found in kibble. Um, so from a raw standpoint, I love the idea that it's not processed, it's not kibble, um, but just some of the, uh, I don't know if you call them tenets or, or, or some of the sort of fundamentals of raw feeding mm -hmm. aren't necessarily backed by science and um, unfortunately not evidence-based. And so when it comes to these scientific studies you're, you're referencing, how are they designed and, and constructed in terms of, you know, I don't know what the right language to use is, whether it's an arm or, or what in the you know, veterinary space, but, you know, how, how do you, what, what's a control group and what is the experimental group? And given there are so many variables there, whether it's kibble okay well what type of kibble was it quote grain-free kibble well grain-free how and then and then home cooked how what was the macronutrient breakdown what was the what was the uh, type of protein used etc and then on the raw food if you were to, if that were to be a separate one how does how does one control for the the multiple multiple number of variables um when when designing these studies um because i know this, you have the same problem on the human side where you know, it's, it's basically possible to design a scientific study in, in a way to prove whatever outcome you want to prove because there are so many variables. And if you just control for the right variables, you'll get the outcome that, that you want. So, you know, when it, how, how, does, how is that accounted for when it, when it comes to some of these, um, you know, studies that, you know, are they already starting with a hypothesis or is it kind of a clean slate, you know, open mind, beginner's mind type of approach? I know that was kind of a very open-ended question, but. It, it is open-ended, but it's an excellent question. And there's a lot of layers to it, unfortunately. And, and, you know, one of the things we pride ourselves at just with for dogs is transparency and kind of being straight shooters. We do it not just in our branding, we kind of function that way. And it might mm -hmm. come from the fact that Sean and I kind of the original executives on the, on the team are that way. And so I'm going to give you the, the raw, true answer and that is that unfortunately at the very top level um, it comes down to the questions that are being asked and unfortunately that is highly political right now in the veterinary in the veterinary world and that's just mm -hmm. the truth um, academic institutions have been historically asking questions that quite frankly as a as a veterinarian interested in whole food nutrition I, I look at those questions and i go why why do you care you know about about how one kibble you know uh, affects health over another why do you care about uh you know levels of um, feed grade uh minerals in one diet over another and Primarily, that's been because that's what they've had to work with. And then in some cases, it's been because the companies funding the research or, or funding um, independent research within that group or, or sponsoring research within that group 
uh, may um, be involved in wanting to answer those types of questions. So the landscape and the politics historically have um, made it un unlikely and uh, uncommon for people to be asking the right questions. Up until you get uh, folks that are emerging that want those questions to be answered and quite frankly, up until you get companies that emerge that focus on this type of nutrition and start um, changing the tide a little bit. And so uh, I guess this is a long-winded way to answer your open-ended question, but the, 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 it all starts with the questions you want to ask. And so a, a more specific example is that um, a digestibility study. So for example, recently uh, we published, uh, well, we didn't publish, but the University of Illinois published a paper on the digestibility of fresh whole foods. Now we were involved because we provided them the Just Food for Dogs food, and we were interested in finding out the, the true digestibility of our food. So there are mm -hmm. ways to um, estimate digestibility, and what the University of Illinois was able to do is actually measure it. And what they found is that our uh, food is, no surprise, much more digestible than ever expected, but then also even more digestible than what would have been predicted by even the uh, most... Um, uh, appropriate formula for digestibility, uh, which is the human food formula. So, so the formula you would apply to uh, fresh human food um, fed to humans. And so uh, this really was the first time ever that uh, a uh, fresh whole food diet balanced for pets, for dogs, mm -hmm. was proven to have higher digestibility um, than ever, ever um, calculated before. And then uh, subsequently, um, we also uh, ran a, uh, to answer your question again more specifically, a subsequent study with the same group where we took the digestibility of our food on two of our recipes, so uh, the beef and the chicken, for example, and we stacked it up against the digestibility of a popular kibble, a, a top-selling kibble, and the digestibility of a top-selling um, uh, minimally processed food. So it's still a feed grade food, but it's minimally processed, um, not necessarily uh, fresh frozen, uh, but not kibble either, or not freeze dried either. So it's more kind of like when you see the, the food that comes in those logs, mm. um, it's, it's more like that. And what we found is that our food being the least processed, just cooked, um, is uh, more digestible than both of those. Um, again, uh, they use the number of dogs needed to achieve uh, statistical significance, and they do the analysis with math, and they find out, wow, yeah, this is more digestible. They also found, no surprise, that our food uh, leads to lower uh, fecal volume, so lower, smaller poops, um, and uh, by a significant amount with the kibble, no surprise, and then also still uh, by a significant amount with the what's supposed to be uh, more uh, minimally processed food. And so that's how you start chipping at the research. Uh, you have to ask the right question and you have to be in a position to do so. And the good news is that um, veterinarians and academic groups that are focused on nutrition are now starting to emerge. It's a, it's a double fold, right? So now they're starting to emerge knowing that these concepts like us exist and they want to know and they want to ask those questions because they're curious because that's how who we are as academics and, and scientists we're curious so they want to ask those questions we're in a position to help them to help them um, ask those questions by providing the food and um in, in addition to that you're actually starting to get a reduction in the funding for research that's being done by the kibble companies, the traditional ones that used to uh, be all over this, like Purina, now Royal Canin, uh, Hills, those guys traditionally were the only ones answering these questions. And I haven't seen anything published in nutrition by folks that usually are um, involved with those groups one way or another for really years, um, uh, months for sure, maybe a couple years. And so um, I think you're getting a shift. And uh, what you're seeing now is better designed studies that are more specifically focusing on 
uh, fresh food and even raw. Um, and now I think we're going to start getting uh, some better data and better publications and better questions answered going forward. Again, chipping away at that evidence-based rationale. Very interesting. Well, I feel like we could have a super long discussion on all the you know, technical nature of the, the studies and, and everything. Um, but I'm guessing that our listeners are interested in, okay, Dr. Chavez, let's say that, uh, you know, I'm not able to afford just for food for dogs right now, or, you know, um, I, I just, I just want to give this a shot myself. Yeah. What would a, how, how would um, one go about creating a nice balanced home cooked meal for their dog? Yeah, that's a great question. And the good news is you don't have to buy our food. <laughs> um, we offer all of our uh, recipes um, on our website. Um, they're available through what we call our do-it-yourself DIY kits. And uh, if you just wanted to try it and give it a go, maybe you wanted to feed your dog fresh whole food for a month just to kind of see what, and I do recommend anybody try this exercise because within a month you will see transformative change. Um, it, it, the same is true for your own nutrition, by the way. Um, and you know, it's one of those things that as I learned more about the nutrition uh, and the impact of it on our pets, I started looking at my own nutrition and uh, finally, uh, you know, about a year ago, swore off all essentially processed foods and kind of started going with a whole food diet, mm -hmm. uh, mainly plant-based, but I say based loosely because I will introduce occasionally some, some chicken, but when I do, I, I use chicken breast, like the whole breast, right? Not, not necessarily a processed um, sliced chicken or anything. Nuggets? Yeah, and like you don't want to do nuggets and all that. And I and that's all. I've always been active. I've I've always played ice hockey, but that's literally the only change I made last year. And I lost forty five pounds over the last. Year, wow. Um, with without making any other sort of like conscious change, I probably became more active because I because I was eating better. But that wasn't it wasn't part of the plan. So so this is my long winded way of saying that um, yes. Yeah, so you want to feed a fresh whole food diet. Um, and, um, and, and, the, and the reason for that is because the science is showing that even within 30 days, you start to see a transformation. And so what I would say to your folks, and if they can't buy our food, download our, our recipe off our website. Um, you don't even have to buy the DIY kit. I'll explain what that's all about later, but you can just get the recipe from, from the links on our website. You can get the ingredients, um, and then you can make the food at home and feed it to your dog and see how they do. Now, I would only do it that way for about 30 days if, if you're going to. If, if you feel like this is the way I want to feed my dog going forward, then you want to make sure it's properly balanced for long-term feeding. And at that point, then you do benefit from actually purchasing the, the nutrient blend, which is the rest of the DIY kit. Um, but uh, if, if you, all you want to do is try fresh whole foods and see what, of an, what kind of impact it would do on your on your pets, you don't necessarily have to spend money on our products. Um, you will have to buy the ingredients, uh, but depending on where you purchase, if you go to Costco, et cetera, um, you could probably do that for relatively inexpensive and the recipes are pretty easy. Mm -hmm. So comparing, you know, just starting at the highest level, let's say, you know, macronutrient wise, how does a just food for dogs meal compare to a basic kibble that's out there if taking yeah. into account you know protein fat carb yeah that's a great question so we have a line of six regular daily diets for healthy dogs and within that line you're going to get your variability of your macronutrients and so um, our most rounded diet is our beef and russet potato recipe so that is about and the numbers are you know not exactly this but it's pretty close it's about 33 percent protein 33% calories from fat and 33% calories from carbohydrates. So you get a really well-rounded source of your carbohydrates, a third from, from each one of those macronutrients. Because you can only get uh, calories from those three macronutrients. So you can't get calories from vitamins or minerals and mm -hmm. water doesn't provide calories. So out of all the macronutrients, the only calories come from protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And so that's gonna be our best rounded one, right? But then we also have a low protein recipe for those dogs that are aging, getting older, maybe they don't 
quite have liver or kidney disease, but you kind of want to protect those vital organs in later in life. Um, or you just don't necessarily feel like you have to feed them a whole bunch of protein for all the reasons I said before. And so for that, we have our lamb and brown rice recipe, for example. So lamb uh, is an excellent low phosphorus meat. And uh, so phosphorus is another um, uh, nutrient that is essential, but in excess amounts, it has to be cleared by the kidney. And so in excess amounts, it might put the kidney to work. So I like that diet as a diet for our aging dogs because of the lower protein profiles. So it has lower protein, moderate fat, and a little bit higher carbohydrates. And so I always love to use that as an example of, see, carbohydrates can be good. There's sort of this demonization of carbohydrates online, um, somewhat fueled by the idea that carbs are fillers, that they uh, don't provide calories. That's just not true. They provide exact same calories in, um, on a per gram basis than protein do. Um, um, but uh, I think what, where it stems from is that there is such thing as bad carbohydrates, bad quality carbohydrates, but those are usually um, your feed grade moldy grains that can make it into pet food. Um, usually you're talking about the ingredients that go into kibble and canned food. Um, once the carbohydrates an actual potato or an actual sweet potato, you're eating you're feeding your dog the same nutritious carbohydrates that that you that you would feed yourself with real diced boiled potatoes and and uh, sweet potatoes and then, and then, so that's the kind of the two ends of the spectrum as far as protein but then we also have we do have a high protein diet so our venison and squash diet is our version of a high protein low carbohydrate diet because we use butternut squash and butternut squash is a low glycemic carbohydrate. So a lot of folks that transition onto our food and are coming off of the raw uh, food might gravitate towards that diet because it, it, it sort of uh, caters to them and, and their philosophy of wanting to feed a higher protein diet. Um, it's about 44% protein on a dry matter basis, which we deem to be you know suitable. Um, we don't really have too much uh, reason to go any higher than that. And then um, the carb source is a low glycemic healthy carbohydrate. So uh, that would be a good option. So I guess to answer your question, the way we do it is we have six diets, but each one has its own unique macronutrient profile. And depending on your dog's needs, um, or uh, in some cases, your own uh, beliefs and of what might be better for your dog, our nutrition consultants, which are all veterinary trained at our locations, are um, uh, uh, educated to to help you navigate through that and, and match up with the right meal, or in some cases, you might want a variety of two or three options. Very interesting. Um, you know, when it comes to the type of protein selected, you know, you've got beef, uh, cod, chicken, turkey, venison, lamb, etc. You know, we, we've had a, num a number of holistic veterinarians on the show, and, you know, they always talk about, you know, the the, the, the warmth level or the temperature of, of foods as it's, you know, kind of rooted in traditional Chinese medicine. So you have beef, for example, being a, a relatively neutral meat, whereas venison is a very warming or hot meat. Um, chicken can tend to be hot. And so they might suggest that, okay, if you have a dog who's, you know, really achy and has some inflamed joints or some itchy skin that, that it may be, you know, better to have them on a, on a war or on a neutral or cooling meat, for example, yeah. any, what's your, your thought on that? And, and to what extent is there any, you know, scientific or, or studies that maybe suggest that there might be some truth to that? All right. You're trying to get me in trouble with my holistic colleagues, aren't you? <laughs> um, no, again, I, I promised to, to answer honestly, so I'm going to have to, but, um, so, so yeah, I'm very well aware, and I, again, I have colleagues uh, that uh, that are into holistic and Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right; it it, it takes into account um, uh, teachings that have been around for hundreds of years um, about about the cooling and warming inflammatory natures of meats, and there is a philosophy behind it. But when you but when you then apply the standard of evidence-based uh, scientific literature, that's where that concept starts to fail. Um, I'm not saying there's enough, I can't say that there's nothing to it because I don't know that to be true. It just wouldn't meet our evidence-based standard in the traditional sense. Having said that, 
it's around for a reason, and and uh, there's a lot of um, uh, folks that uh, abide by that for their own nutrition and find success. And so, um, my and I'm not going to ignore the power of tradition and anecdotal, uh, you know, hundreds of years of anecdotal evidence. And so, um, I think I, th I I'm in, I'm supportive because what happens in either situation is the uh, pet parent is taking the dog and taking him off kibble and putting him on real food, which is good. Mm -hmm. And that's always going to um, jump. Uh, but our recipes, our six daily diets are not necessarily based on the Eastern um, um, philosophy. Having right. said that, we're in Southern California, we're in New York, we have holistic partners as, as, uh, uh, as veterinarians and customers. And so um, we also have 14 vets on staff. So one of our vets actually went to the veterinary uh, school where they taught um, a certificate program in Eastern medicine. Mm. Um, and we do custom diets for folks that want that philosophy incorporated into their uh, pet's food um, on, on, you know, on a monthly basis. And so we can cater to that. Um, it's just not the um, uh, front line mainstream product that we offer. Um, okay. But uh, we are aware with it. And we are aware of it and we do cater to it. Yeah. So it sounds like it's the kind of thing where it, it, there, there isn't enough evidence out there to support, you know, you guys making any sort of, you know, massive changes or for you to even say, yes, like there's truth to this simply because the evidence doesn't exist. But it, but it sounds like it, 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 it's, it's the whole, you know, philosophy or the whole maxim of absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right. That's and true. so, you know, there certainly if, if there were, it sounds like if there were enough, um, if there was enough critical mass to actually do studies and, and construct them in a valid way that, that did meet your scientific criteria, you would say, yes, this seems valid and, and you know, under these, you know, experimental conditions, um, et cetera. But right now there isn't anything to refute it, but there isn't anything really to strongly support it at the same time. It's kind of what I hear you saying. Yeah, not. I, I'm not saying there's no evidence because uh, I'm sure the holistic folks and the Eastern medicine folks will say, "Oh, we got you know, tons of tradition and that." So I'm just saying there's no evidence by the standard of scientific, okay. peer-reviewed research um, that that we're comfortable with. Having said that, we do make those diets, and we will work with a pet parent and a veterinarian that wants to make those diets um, through our custom formulation service. But yes, the answer to your question is is right. We're always looking to answer new questions. And if some research group somewhere in the world says, you know what, it is true that, so for example, one that we get a lot is that our lamb, uh, that our uh, uh, renal diets, our kidney diets are lamb based. And lamb is a hot meat. And that uh, if you have kidney disease, you want a cooling meat. Mm -hmm. um, if something came out that would support that, that was peer reviewed and robust and compelling, uh, we would likely make that uh, consideration into that formulation and have to reformulate. But safe of that, we'll make them a custom diet for those folks, but we're not going to change something that is already right. working for a lot of folks. Right. Yeah, well, what I really like and respect about your guys' approach is you have, you have very specific criteria around which you determine um, this meets our, our criteria for scientific credibility. Because you know, certainly there are other folks who would have a completely different standard of, quote, scientific credibility. And, you know, you guys are saying, no, it needs to check these boxes. And that's how we're going to, you know, run, run our ship. And so, you know, there's a certain element of consistency that I as a consumer could could expect with that. And I think, you know, there's a deep level of uh, a certain level of trust that, that comes with that. So you know, I commend you guys for having a, you know, very you know, set standard around that. Yeah, and if you think about the the dynamic that you started with, which is that there's all these uh, that nutrition's like religion, and there's all these beliefs that we believe keeps us grounded. Because otherwise, what we would be doing is the equivalent of checking the the air, right, and seeing where things are going, and then going that direction. And we don't right. do that. Um, there are pet food companies out there that do. They say, oh, you know, when the whole DCM thing came, okay, put tarring in the food, and everyone put tarring in the food. Oh, everyone wants grain-free. Okay, come out with only grain-free diets. Some of our competitors did the mistake of just coming out with grain-free diets. And then DCM, you know, rocked yeah. them. And, and they were like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? Well, we've always had grain and grain-free diets. So it wasn't as impactful for us. And again, it keeps you grounded. So yeah, I agree with all that. Right. Are you good for another five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I want, we, we kind of talked on this a little bit before um, around the, you know, what it is about, 
what, what it is that we are learning potentially about the processing of foods and why that might be detrimental both to you know, a dog's health as well as a human side and kind of gets down to you know, the, the, the cellular or, or molecular level there. Could, so you, could you just you know, give a, an overview about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I have to back up and just kind of tell the story that right now we are in California, Seattle, New York. We um, ship nationwide. We are getting ready to open kitchens in Texas as well. Um, and essentially, we've become a national veterinary brand. We did a survey last year uh, among 16,000 veterinarians and compared, uh, you know, asked them to uh, compare our product to all of our fresh whole food competitors. Um, and uh, they, they chose us above all of them. And so um, it, there's, there's definitely um, a, 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 a uh, nationwide acceptance of our food. That has been driven 100% by the efficacy of the food. We have spent zero dollars on TV or radio advertising. We do now have a marketing team, but I kind of joke, you know, we just hired our first uh, chief marketing officer about six months ago. Um, before that, you know, we've been in business 10 years. Before that, there was no one with marketing in their title on our executive team. That's usually what a pet food company hires first, right? <laughs> so how do you do that? How do you grow? How do you get that acceptance? How do you penetrate the market like that without advertising um, in, in the traditional sense? And, uh, and the reason we did that is, is because of the efficacy of the food. Literally, the transformi transformative changes of getting a dog off of a processed diet or a kibble or a can, because canned food is processed as well. It happens to be feed grade as well, which means that it's the scraps from the human food chain, right? Not the choice cuts of meat. Mm -hmm. And then we get them off that and you put them on a real whole food diet and all of a sudden those ear infections that were thought to be chronic and untreatable clear up. Those weekly cycles of staph pyoderma, which is a staph infection that they get on their skin start to clear up. So that we've seen anecdotally with our customers over the last 10 years. And we know that happens. But then the question becomes is how do you prove that with evidence, right? And what kind of research do you need in order to prove that? Well, this is really exciting. Thanks to a lot of the work that has been done in human nutrition, a lot of folks and researchers are looking into something called AGEs. So that's the, the letter A, G, and E, right? Mm -hmm. And those stand for advanced glycation end products. And what these are are these compounds that are formed by high temperature processing. So the kibble making process, the canning process, our own process, food, Dorito chips, all of that, will form uh, uh, even roasted uh, nuts and, and, and that kind of thing, will form uh, these AGEs. And these AGEs are shown to accumulate in the body. And the consumption of foods high in AGEs will lead to the accumulation of AGEs in certain tissues that have been researched in human nutrition. So the heart, the kidney, uh, the liver, in your blood, and that will lead to chronic disease. So heart disease, kidney disease, and then in the blood, diabetes. And so the most famous AG that people will probably recognize, but didn't realize it was an AG, uh, is hemoglobin A1C. And what do we do to make sure we don't have diabetes? We get our hemoglobin A1C checked, and if it's under a certain amount, all right, great. You don't, you're not diabetic, but if you go up and accumulate too much, then, but no one's ever backed up and gone, well, where's it coming from? <laughs> and what the researchers in human nutrition are figuring out is that it's coming from processed foods. Mm -hmm. And what they're able to do now is reverse type two diabetes in almost every case uh, with a strict adherence in diet to whole foods. And so it was this kind of like um, realization and emergence of science about a year ago that, that made me realize, holy crap, I have, to, I have to stop eating processed foods because I can see that this is where the science is going. Um, and we believe that is going to end up being the answer to uh, the efficacy of our food, that essentially the uh, AGE levels of uh, fresh whole food are much lower because you don't have that high temperature processing uh, are much lower than what accumulates in kibble and in canned food. And by getting them off the can and kibble food, you start uh, reducing the amount of AGEs that are being uh, uh, consumed and hopefully 
essentially start to clear them. And that's what's reversing chronic disease. Now there's, a, I think, a book, I haven't read it yet, but I keep hearing about it called How Not to Die. Um, and it's all about eating just uh, fresh whole foods and plant-based and, and all of that. And, um, and uh, there's a documentary on Netflix everyone talks about. And really, we think the science behind that might end up being this concept of AGEs. And uh, it's really, really interesting. And, and we can't wait till those questions get answered in veterinary nutrition. Interesting. So it sounds like, you know, we've always had the suspicion that processed foods weren't good, but maybe we didn't have the, um, you know, the, um, the, what's the word? Anyway, the, the, the mechanism, right? The mechanism, the, the reason behind it. Yeah. Yeah. The guilty, the guilty party in the whole thing that really pointed to it. And so advanced glycation end products, from what I understand is basically the bonding of protein and or fats to carbohydrates and they may or may not occur. They, they can probably also occur outside of high processing environments, but they especially occur in these high temperature, super process um, sort of um, processes that, that our food supply is you know, inundated with. Yeah, absolutely. So you're gonna create AGs no matter what in your body. Um, it's a reaction, right? But high temperature, forces that reaction. It's the browning that you get in meats, for example, when you mm. do a barbecue, right? And it's delicious and people love it until they eat it, right? Um, but in, at, at an excess, which is high temperature uh, processing kibble canned foods, um, there's just way too many in there and they start accumulating in tissues. And the reason they accumulate in tissues is because your body thinks, oh, that, that's protein or, or fat, right? And the heart needs protein and fat. So it starts building heart muscle and protein and, and, and amino acids in the heart with what it thinks is a normal protein, but instead it's an AGE. And before you know it, you've got more AGEs than you should in your heart muscle. And then that leads to heart disease. And so, yeah, it's, a full, it's almost a foreign invader. You make them yourself and you have them in your body but it's almost by consuming and overloading your body with these uh, foreign um, substances, they start accumulating in your, in, your, in your vital organs and potentially leading to disease. And you're right, we've known for a while now the correlation between processed foods and health has been, and bad health has been sort of documented in study after study, but it's only really been in the last five to 10 years that the culprit is being uh, ne um, zeroed in on. And that culprit seems to be these AGEs. Wow, very interesting. Yeah. Um, all right, doctor, I think we've covered a, a lot of ground here. So I learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners did as well. And very excited to know that you guys are out there. You know, I'm up in, in Northern California, um, but you guys are down in Orange County. And of course, people can order online and get, get stuff delivered around the country. So just food for dogs dot com. Uh, Dr. Chavez, any, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we sign off? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I, I would be wrong not to uh, give advice uh, during this, this crazy time that we have going on, right? Please. Now, more, now more than ever. Um, and I'm not even, you know, talking about your pets, because obviously COVID-19 and the virus that causes COVID-19 um, isn't affecting pets the way it affects us. Um, but uh, I'm talking about your own health. Um, you know, hopefully uh, this helps you with what you choose to feed your, your pets. But also this is the time to start looking in your pantry and in your refrigerator and start thinking about what you feed yourself. Because this virus is, is a great example of how when something like this comes around, you wanna be as healthy and fit as possible. And uh, with this link that's emerging between these AGEs and processed foods and uh, bad health, uh, I think now is the best time than ever once we get through this um, to turn over a new leaf and really start uh, feeding yourself and your pet um, fresh, wholesome food. I'm talking about farmed uh, or grown, uh, things that you can recognize on your plate um, that uh, is really just real food. Yeah. Excellent. Well, great message to close on. Dr. Oscar Chavez, thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. All right. Take care. You too.